so it's really a pleasure to, to be here today and, and, and the event is absolutely fantastic. And it's, it's really an honor to share the stage with Rodney. Um, and uh, you know, Rodney is really the genius on robotics um, and I really admire your career from an academic and industrial perspective. And in my way, I would say you're the Tom Brady of robotics. And you know, that's, in my book, that's the highest honor, so you can't top that anymore. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we think about robotics, and I'm glad that you didn't say the opposite of what we was gonna present. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about cloud robotics and connected robots, and what does that mean maybe for the future industrial era, and I call it the human industrial uh, internet, where humans and robots collaborate and, and, uh, and work together. But what, is, what do we think about a robot today? What is a robot when you think about that? And I, I have sort of three examples, of course, the, the first one we think about is a Roomba. I think everybody knows a Roomba, everybody knows the vacuum cleaning robot, and it's really the robot that took robotics into the consumer space where people now identify with what robots are and see, see them as being useful. Um, so it's, it's definitely the most successful robot in the history of robots, so thank you, Rodney, for that, and congratulations. But if you actually think about it, it's a simple robot that has one task. It's a dedicated task, it's just vacuuming. Right? That's the only thing it does, and actually most of the time it's idle. At least I hope that if you have a Roomba, most of the time it's idle. If it's not, I think you have another problem. <laughs> the, the other thing about robots, when we think about robots, it's these industrial factory robots, which on the other side are the most productive robots we have, operating 24-7, they do extreme uh, tasks, and they really drive productivity in the industrial uh, environments and factories that, that Rodney mentioned but they're static, they don't move around typically, they perform one task and they perform it over and over and over and over again. They can be reprogrammed to do different tasks, but generally they perform the same task over and over again and they're very, very good at doing that. But still in some sense limited in what they can do. The third uh, example that people generally think about robotics are these mechanical wonders. And I don't wanna name the company, uh, but I think you all recognize this, uh, these robots. They're, they're really geniuses from a mechanical engineering perspective, and I really admire what they're able to do, but I do question a little bit the form factor. I don't really know why I need an ostrich to unload packages from a pallet, so I'm not quite sure about that part, and I'm also not quite sure what the real use case is for these, uh, these, uh, these applications, and whether the form factor drives the use case or the use case drives the form factor. So we think of these as really mechanical wonders that do hero experiments, a lot of intelligence embedded in it, very limited uh, connectivity, and somewhat questionable um, use cases and form factors. Um, so the question is, okay, we have all these robots, they, they do great things, we admire them, they, they serve um, a purpose, but what should the future of robotics really be? And I think when you ask that question, there's only one way you can get the answer, and that's you go to the movies, right? And so uh, let's look at Wally. So I, I um, would suggest to you that Wally represents the state of the art of robotics today. Single robot, somewhat isolated, doesn't really have a lot of friends, performs certain things, performs certain tasks, interesting, cute, um, but isolated in some sense. But fortunately, the directors of the Wally movie also got it right, and towards the end of the movie, they say Wally actually has friends. Uh, and Wally has an army of buddies that are very different to Wally, they work together, they do things together, uh, and they're really a collection of heterogeneous robots, and that's how we think about the future of robotics. It's not single robots doing one thing, but it's a collection of robots, very different, that work together to perform a, a larger task. Right? But what does that really mean now in the, in the real world? So we think that the enterprise of the future will have these multi-purpose collaborative robots, and if you think about a factory of the future. Right now, the picture you have in mind is it's a bunch of assembly lines, robots doing this repetitive task over and over again, but the factory of the future is actually just four walls, a floor and a ceiling, and everything in the factory will be completely reconfigured on an hourly or even minute by minute basis, and the robots will be doing very, very, very different things. So they have to be mobile, they have to work together, they have to dynamically change what they do, and they have to collaborate to perform the task that's being told to them in semi-real time. Right? So, so what's, what's our vision then for robotics? And we call it cloud mind, um, because it's the mind for robots that will reside in the cloud. And we think of it in two ways. One, if, one is it should be a cloud-based orchestration control framework for the collaboration 
automation and control of heterogeneous set of robots. And the second one is it's a framework and a platform to enable the delivery of robotic services. So it's not about the individual robot, it's about the service, the application that that collection of robots perform for you. And in the process, if we're really successful with this, we think we'll continue to democratize the access to robotic services the way Rodney pioneered it with a Roomba and getting robots into everybody's house. We want to continue to democratize the access to robotic services and the development of robotic services um, in the development community. So um, I talk a lot about cloud, but why is cloud good? We shouldn't say we want to move everything to the cloud just because it's, it's hip and it's fashionable. So what are some benefits? Um, so the first one is we would have access to virtually unlimited computing resources, virtually. Um, because of that, we can reduce the complexity and the cost of the individual, individual robots by moving a lot of the functionalities into the cloud. And I think that was the driving factor for Rodney to make sure that the Roomba was at the price point that people can afford it. If your Roomba costs $2,000, nobody will buy it. Uh, so the cloud will really enable us to do that. Uh, we can share sensor information. Sensors uh, and LIDARs and uh, all the embedded sensors in the robot are a big part of the cost of a robot. But if we can share the information, that's very valuable to get a broader view of what's going on in the environment, but also reduce the cost of the robot. And it allows us to upgrade robots more flexibly, maybe not from a hardware perspective, but from the embedded capabilities and functions that robots have. If a lot of that control sits in the cloud, we can upgrade robots much, uh, much easier. And then, of course, once the control is in the cloud, we can control, orchestrate, manage um, multiple robots at the same time. We have a global view of the environment. We can do joint mapping and navigation for robots in the environment. And, um, and we can really assign tasks to whichever robot is in the best position to perform that task at that point in time. But of course, all of this is only possible, we think, in this area because we have uh, distributed clouds, we have increased computing power in the cloud, and we have a 5G network that will allow us to connect all these things in a real-time efficient way. So I would say that a lot of these ideas may have been around and may have been aspirational for, for years or generations, but really now is the era when we can really enable it because we have the networking capabilities to do it. And um, I would say with the dawn of a new era of robotic services where robot capabilities, networking capabilities, and cloud capabilities all come together. And I venture to say that this is the beginning of the golden era of robotic services for the next 50 years. And uh, we'll see, maybe I'll come back in 50 years and see if it turned out to be true. Um, so um, when we talk about robotic services, what do I have in mind? Um, so generally we want robotic services to be universal. Uh, they should be universally acceptable to, accessible to anybody anywhere. They should be shared. Um, I actually have to confess, Rodney, I don't have a Roomba. Um, I, Somehow it feels wasteful to have this beautiful machine sit there in vacuum for one hour a week. But maybe we should be sharing Roombas with, uh, with everybody uh, in the neighborhood. And if you think about the lawn mowing Roomba, it's also wasteful that I spend $1,000 on a on the lawn mowing robot that sits in my backyard, mows on Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock. My neighbor does exactly the same, same thing, and my neighbor's neighbor does exactly the same thing. Why are we not sharing a robot? Why don't we have a lawn mowing Roomba for our neighborhood? And somehow, it's orchestrated. When I'm not home, it's mowing my lawn, and then it goes over to my neighbor's house. And we also want the interface for people to communicate with robots to be very intuitive, both from how they program the robots, but also how they control and how they, how they ask for the services. And then, of course, the robots should be multi-purpose, because if they're multi-purpose, it's much easier to share, share them for different tasks and uh, at different points in time. So I call this the Uber Uber of robotic services. And um, so if you think about Uber as a, the Uber company, uh, but now you think Uber with autonomous cars. So if you're, if you're in Murray Hill and you want to go to Times Square tonight, what would you do with the autonomous Uber? You take out your phone, you type in Times Square, some car shows up, you don't know how, you don't know which car. You just get in, the car will take you to Times Square, you don't know which way it goes, you don't know how it got there, you just get out when you get to Times Square and it's automatically built to you. So why can I not order robotic services in the same way? I want to just say, I will need my lawn mode, and somehow, some, by some magic, a lawn mower shows up, it mows my lawn, and it's done. So I think we want to really enable that kind of simplicity and that kind of level of service for robotics um, going forward. Again, that's our aspiration, and um, with Marcus' support, we'll, we'll get there in the next 
25 years. <laughs> um, OK, so three critical technology neighbors that we, we need for this. Obviously, the muscles. We call them the muscles, the robots, the sensors, everything that's physical about the robot. Because ultimately, this is a physical a service that's provided by physical um, entities. Then we need a nervous system, which is really the communication, compute infrastructure to connect everything. And then we need a brain, which is what we call our cloud mind to orchestrate and intelligently supervise, automate, and control everything. So I just want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the cloud orchestration. I, I don't want to go through all of these, uh, these elements, but they basically fall into three, three categories. The first one is just about understanding what are the robots that you have, what's the environment that you operate in, what are the sensors you have, and learn about your space. And that includes everything from map building, navigation, localization, and so forth, profile discovery for robots. So when you want to decide which robot is doing what, you need to understand what your core capabilities are. The second category of tasks really fall into the allocation of tasks to robots, the control, the collaboration of all the robots. And then the third part is really all about the actuation. You want the robots to do something, and you want people to be able to interface to them. Whether you give a simple command, take me to Manhattan, or you want to actually more, more tightly interact with a robot in a teleoperation way. Um, and I should say, we're working on all of these areas at different degrees of maturity where we are, but we, we're really um, in Bell Labs and with partners uh, really trying to push all of these things and then leverage robotic platforms that are either available or that we build ourselves. And uh, my last slide, just want to uh, show some of these, uh, some of you have seen these, these robots. So this is the latest version of our robotic babies. Uh, they're real. Uh, nobody got that joke. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, you've seen those in the, uh, the Unix World Challenge Arena. And um, these are uh, robots that we, we purchased existing robotic platforms, but we did a lot of surgery and a lot of upgrades to them. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of work that, that goes into these robots, but the point is we're really trying to make it real, like Ita said, and uh, with Rodney's advice, we really try and make it real. We fail a lot, but we learn a lot and we progress, and we really um, try and, and push this forward, but it's a tremendous amount of work. And so I also want to take this slide uh, and pay tribute to the Bell Labs Robotics team and thank them for all the hard work that went into these robots, but also all the work that we've done in the last two, three years on pushing uh, robotics research forward. So a great thank you to, uh, to the robotics team in Bell Labs. And with that, I'll, um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.